Welcome to Home Ties, a podcast about staying connected to home, no matter where you are. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily those of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Hey, joining me in the studio today is my daughter, Christiana Repke, who is visiting us here from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Say hi to everybody, Chrissy. Hi, everybody, Chrissy. (laughs) Chrissy is 21 years old and is currently enrolled as a junior at the Milwaukee School of Engineering. She's studying mechanical engineering. And thanks to COVID, Chrissy is able to spend her Christmas holidays with us here in Malawi. She's enrolled in all of her courses online this semester, so she'll be here uh, with us for about two months. And she's able to dial in remotely from Malawi and attend her lectures. How has that been going for you? Um, well, I like because all my classes are in the morning, so in the States. So here all my classes are in the afternoon, so I can get most of the things I need done in the morning before everything starts. It was like uh, a couple a couple classes you have to stay up pretty late, and you had like an all-night uh, event as well, right? Yeah, I had to be up till 6 a.m. here to run an event till 10 p.m. in the States. Yeah, that must have been interesting for you <laughs> and for the people on the other side, huh? Hopefully I was coherent. <laughs> yeah, you had uh, quite a quite a story in trying to get here. You want to share that story with everybody? I got on my flight in Chicago on time. We left on time. Um, we were coming into Addis in Ethiopia. I was looking at my ticket and it's like, I have time to get through the security and get to my gate. And then like half an hour to 45 minutes extra, I'll be set. Um, so that's exactly what I did. But as it, I was uh, sitting at my gate as it kept getting closer to when the plane was supposed to leave, I didn't hear any announcements. There was no sign that it wasn't, a f- there wasn't going to be a flight leaving there for Malawi, but I guess there wasn't like a sure indicator that it was for Malawi. So I kept asking people, I'm like, am I at the right place? And I guess they were just looking at my gate. And they're like, well, the gate says, I don't know, A6 or whatever. And your ticket says A6, so you're in the right place. But I guess that didn't, the changes to the gate didn't trickle down to everybody else that was working in the airport. So they weren't able to tell me that my flight just wasn't leaving from that gate. So I missed my flight. You missed your flight and then you were stuck in Addis for two days? Yeah, a little bit less than two days. Yeah, what was that like? It was interesting to see everything. It was kind of a lot of just alone time, eating airplane bread. No, it wasn't your first trip to Africa. You've made trips like this before, and obviously all kinds of things can go wrong or unexpected when you're traveling. But you were pretty upset uh, this time. Can you uh, explain why? Yeah, because, I mean, I was thinking even just the night before, I realized how much I was going to miss everybody back in Milwaukee because I hadn't really processed that before because we were just hurrying to figure everything out because it was a couple weeks between me deciding and then me leaving. So I was thinking about that. You said you were not nervous the night before, um, but you were just beginning to understand that you were going to miss, how much you were going to miss your friends. Yeah. And then you get stuck in the airport for two days. Yeah. (laughs) It just... Two days to think about all that. <laughs> yeah. And then even on the when you finally get on the connecting flight uh, to Malawi, there was a delay at another point, and there was an air, airline strike in, South, in Africa. South Africa, so the flight you were supposed to take from Blantyre, Malawi, to the long way was delayed by a couple of hours, so I just added insult to injury, huh? <laughs> yeah, it felt longer than the two days, I guess. Yeah. Well, we're uh, really glad to have you with us here, and uh, you'll be here for about another month or so, and we are definitely looking forward to taking some time off next week going to the beach with you. But uh, we know that uh, come 23rd of January, you'll be getting on the plane to go back to the United States. That's never really easy for us or for you, 
Is it? No. <laughs> it's not. And when you get back to the United States, of course, your friends will be there. Your work will be waiting for you. But there will be a little bit of you left behind in Malawi. Yep. <laughs> um, it's impossible to be in two places at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And we're just thankful that you've got some good friends and some a good support network there in Milwaukee to help take care of you and give you the support that you need. And we try and stay in touch by WhatsApp and by video conferences, but obviously it's not the same thing. Yeah. So let's uh, talk a little bit about your experiences of going to college. Uh, for the first year of school at MSOE. Basically, the timeline was your mom and I left for Africa in June of 2017, and you, we left you with my mother in Appleton, Wisconsin area. And then you started school in Milwaukee beginning of September sometime. So what yeah. was that like when you first showed up at school? Can you, what can you remember about that? I remember moving day pretty clearly because everybody else was kind of already there. Um, my aunt texted me last minute. She was like, hey, I'd like to help you move in. So I really appreciated that. So it was nice to have a little bit like of the like world I was leaving connecting me to the world I was entering because I had been in the Fox City area for like about a couple months over the summer. And now I was going to be in Milwaukee just in the school like mindset. It was cool because everybody was on the same page of like, we're all new here, we don't really know what's going on, so we're going to figure it out together. So I guess that's a good way to make friends. So everybody's looking for somebody else to like, just relate to. How many of those uh, students were from Alabama? None. I could, I could say probably none. <laughs> so most of those uh, students were from the upper Midwest, right? Yeah, yeah. Chicago, Wisconsin area. Was it uh, difficult for you to make friends? I think that because everybody was in that mindset when we first started out, it was relatively easy. Just be, be friendly with people and then like continue to hang out with them and we became friends. Um, but I think... After a while, everybody tried to like form their own little groups, and they weren't as inclusive. I think people were still like excited to meet new people, but school started like a week later after we were all oriented to the school. So, mm -hmm. so uh, would you say that you still have uh, many friends, or just a few friends? Um, I think I have many. Friends, but not very many close friendships. And uh, you've had quite a few different roommates over the years as well, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And we don't have to get into that uh, too many details, <laughs> but uh, that's uh, one of the phenomenon of uh, of children who grow up uh, in a in an overseas environment when they come back to the United States or wherever their country of origin is. That uh, they're usually pretty adept at making new friends, but Sometimes it's difficult to have deep friendships. Would you say that's true for you? Yeah. I don't really want to be a victim of my circumstances, but I wish I could change that. <laughs> right, right. Well, if it's any uh, comfort to you, I had, during my six years of college, I had uh, different roommates every year as well. Mm -hmm. so, let's talk for a little bit about your move from the southern part of the United States to the north. Now, you had lived in Wisconsin from 2004 to 2008, but you were only four, you were eight years old when you left Wisconsin and you spent nine years living in Alabama during a pretty formative time of your life. So you moved from, you moved back to Wisconsin from Alabama. You moved from the city of Huntsville, Alabama to the city of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Huntsville is a military town, and it's also a town which is a high-tech sector, so it attracts people from all over the world. Milwaukee is more known, I think, historically for its manufacturing base, and it does have an immigrant population, but primarily from Central Europe. So, you care to comment on uh, the what was the military influence in 
in Alabama, and I'm thinking about your school. Um, yeah, I mean, it was pretty strong influence in the town and in my school, I guess, too, because we our JRTC program was probably like the biggest club at the school, um, biggest after school program. Um, there, there were more students, I think, in the program at our school than any other school in the area as well. Um, and then in the north, like most people I talk to in college don't really know a lot about J or ROTC. They don't have a lot of influence in their lives from the military. So that was interesting to see how the differences were and like how that affected, I guess, things that were part of my identity moving on into Wisconsin. Um, I know we don't want to overgeneralize, but do you care to comment on some general differences between uh, what you saw in Huntsville and the North as far as, you know, personalities or openness to people from the outside? Everybody is pretty friendly, I guess, no matter where you go. But um, I think that in the South, maybe it's because being part of pastor's family too, but people seemed a lot more like, eager to catch up with you, or if they didn't know you, to be like, getting to know you, um, and in the north, it's kind of like, we do the thing that we're here for, and then we leave. More of a, let's get down to business mentality. I think, yeah. Yeah. So, that was a, a pretty significant uh, change that you had to negotiate. I think also, another big change in that time of your life was moving basically the transition from high school to college. A lot of kids struggle with that time in their life because when they're in high school, of course, they're living in their parents' home, they've got their teachers keeping a, a closer look on them, and then they get to college and, you know, nobody's really holding their hand. You care to comment on how you negotiated that change? Well, yeah. In high school, I guess I was in a pretty small program within the school for the academics. So we had like a lot of deadline, important projects, papers, required a lot of like research and everything. And I think that teachers were really like, hey, you gotta get this done. We think it's important. We know that it's gonna help you in your life. Of course, like I go to a small college too. So there is some, still that, that feeling to some extent, but the professors don't like come knocking on your door and be like, hey, I really need you to do this lab, and you haven't turned it in, and you have, it's, like, due in, like, two hours. Like, please, mm -hmm. get it done. Mm -hmm. That's definitely not the thing that happens in college. Mm -hmm. How did the fact that your parents weren't, uh, around, even in the country, how did that affect your understanding of, you know, what you had to do in college? I guess it's kind of the same for everybody going to college where you, your parents aren't there anymore, like, in the same house, most of them. I guess at least. But I guess there's a lot of kids that I know from school that go home for the holidays or like just on breaks or weekends. So it's finding more like adults in the immediate area to be role models, which I don't know if I really looked in too much first couple of years of school. You felt you had to do it on your own? Yeah. And why is that, do you think? Parents weren't there. I guess even when I talked to you guys about some of the stuff I was doing, you were like, that's beyond my level. Um, so. Yeah, I stopped helping you do your math homework when you hit seventh grade, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's a while ago. All of the professors, or like other adults I knew, were professors. So it wasn't like they wanted to give away the answers or actively were choosing to be role models. Because their position in my life was just like, give me challenging things that way I can understand the material for myself but not like necessarily how to deal with this whole transition too. So one of the key differences maybe between you and your classmates is that at least your classmates had parents that they could go home for for the holidays or maybe some relatives that would come visit them on campus during parents weekend and provide them a little support. Mm -hmm. You didn't really have that. Yeah, and I know I did have I do have family in the Milwaukee area, but it's not the same as like the people that you grew up in their house. Right, you didn't really get to know your grandparents that well, I guess, because you lived so so many years away from them. 
So one of the things that we you know, talked about earlier was how I asked you, are you, did you have homesickness? And you basically said, well, how do you have homesickness when you don't have a home to go back to? Yeah, so it's, I guess it was a lot of feeling out of place, like missing what didn't exist as a home anymore, but still really wanting that feeling. So the place that you knew as your home didn't exist anymore. Your parents didn't live in that community anymore. Your culture of being part of the pastor's family was gone. You know, you basically you went from being a celebrity to just a, one of the pew, one of the parishioners in the pew. I think in some ways it was worse than being homesick. Yeah, there were a lot of things that just didn't exist anymore for me. And that is a uh, common phenomenon for many children who grew up in uh, foreign culture or outside of their parents' culture. And then they find themselves not really belonging in the place where they grew up and not really belonging in the place where their parents are from. It's a difficult place to be. Let's uh, talk a little bit now about how perhaps, though, that has given you some uh, advantages in life uh, because you have been forced to, to basically get out of your comfort zone, out of the traditional culture and relationships that you've known. Do you think you're immune to culture shock? I don't think anybody is. Some people are very comfortable with how they live, though. So I guess when they do have to adjust, it's more of a shock to them, even if it's just small things. So I guess being more comfortable in unfamiliar situations, to some extent. Can you give an example? I don't know. I don't know if it's really maybe more willing to take risks and stuff. I guess coming here for two months was kind of a risk. Really? Yeah. I mean, I feel like all these factors I had to consider, like not working for two months, doing all my classes online when I did not enjoy online classes, when we were fully online in the spring, being away from friends, leaving just things unattended in Milwaukee, and like trusting that everything was going to be like reasonably okay as to where I left them. Like, they might not be when I come back, but I'm going to have to deal with that. And I think maybe that's part of the just accepting risk. Yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't, I just didn't even consider that that would be something that you'd have to even think twice about coming to spend some time with your parents. <laughs> but obviously, you didn't grow up here. And obviously, you have uh, a life of your own that you, you know, have gotten used to over the last several years. So, yeah, I thank you for coming. Thank you for agreeing to. <laughs> To take that risk. You've had some other overseas experiences as well. Uh, you spent some time in, in Central America. Mm -hmm. um, what was it like when you came up against some of those cultural differences? Um, well, it was really interesting because we were in Nicaragua and the Dominican Republic for about like two weeks each, I think. And it was really hard. I don't know if I was just homesick at this point to some extent or I was just tired of traveling, but it was really hard for me to adjust from being in the Dominican Republic to Nicaragua. And I think it might be due to like the socioeconomic structure of the countries too. I guess at some point I was kind of burnt out from traveling and I had to like make myself realize like what a like great opportunity it was for me to be there. And like make the most out of it because I did, I did really wanted to go on that trip. Yeah, there's that thing about culture shock. Like the first week is a big high, big excitement, and then you kind of hit a wall, yeah, realizing guess, how difficult this is. I guess that was my third week of traveling. So even if it was in a different country, it was just realizing that hey, I'm not in the states anymore. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Well, yeah, and you don't have to go to a foreign country to experience culture shock. You can experience culture shock by crossing the street and going into a different neighborhood in the United mm -hmm. States. You live in a city that, you know, is much more segregated than the city that we used to live in in Huntsville, Alabama. You want to comment on that a little bit? It's weird to me because it makes me I guess, uncomfortable to some extent that there is such a division in culture and people like don't understand 
like what's going on with other people and they don't really care because they're comfortable in their lives or they don't want to have their perspectives challenged. Sometimes it can be frustrating to deal with people who have those attitudes. And I even like, I miss aspects of cultures other than the culture that is primarily presented in the part of Milwaukee I'm in. So where we lived in uh, the Huntsville community, we lived in a fairly integrated neighborhood racially, I would say. Uh, I'd say economically, people were pretty much all solid middle class. But uh, the school that you went to, that was definitely a mix of some uh, middle cl- middle income or middle class income kids and some lower income class kids. And you were uh, in the minority in that school two ways, one because of your race and two because you were in uh, an international baccalaureate program, which was a smaller subset of the students in the school. How did you deal with that? I don't know that I really noticed it, but I know what I noticed most is that when I was in JROTC, I was kind of put on a platform because I think I was seen as a potential role model for these other students who weren't in such like in the intensive um, program because the instructor wanted everybody to be pushing themselves to be their best and they might not have had role models in their lives that had either the opportunities to do that for them. Was there ever any time when you felt sorry for yourself that you were stuck in this program and not some other program with people who were more, quote, like you? I didn't feel sorry for myself. I I did wrestle with that sometimes. Like, why am I putting myself through this? Especially since I'm a little bit more engineering-minded, and it was a lot of just, like, humanities and stuff, which I enjoy, and I think... This program really deepened my appreciation for as well. So cool. I don't think I ever felt like, wow, I wish I was with this type of people. Probably wouldn't have fit in with that either, right? Yeah, I think, think so. Because how many kids that were there in Huntsville that were born in Bulgaria, lived in Wisconsin, and then moved to Alabama when they were uh, in middle school? Right? Yeah. So now uh, it's interesting. You're still in a minority in your school, you're studying mechanical engineering at the Milwaukee School of Engineering in a field which has been traditionally dominated by men. In fact, you don't you have like a, a, a nine to one ratio of <laughs> male to female students in your school? It's 75% guys. Okay, it's not quite that bad. Then. <laughs> it's pretty bad though. <laughs> What's it like being a, a girl student uh, at MSOE? I think sometimes it can have some challenges because I guess at the beginning there were people who just were like coming in with perspectives that they grew up with or just didn't even consider alternatives to. So they would not really listen to my input or even other people too, I guess, in their groups. They wouldn't have their input listened to because they're like, well, you're a girl. But I think a lot of them grew out of it. It's like, you're working with us, you're going to have to deal with it, and we have some decent ideas, just as much as you guys have decent ideas. But I think it's still is difficult at times, because you have to, I feel like there's just so many more things you have to consider as like a woman in engineering, or like a like field that's not typically populated by women, because it's kind of like you are the pioneer in that group and they're like well they won't take you seriously if this is something different than what's been done before or they've never seen people do things this way i guess there's a lot of other women who have done way more things before this but it's still something that i think people myself included can have to consider on a daily basis i saw somebody make a comic about this making sure you have enough punctuation like exclamation marks in your email that you sound friendly, but not too many that you sound ditzy. <laughs> well, I think about that. <laughs> mm. And then being taken seriously by your professors, too. Because, I mean, they're mostly male professors as well. And it's like, you want to be taken seriously by them. But you want to show you're excited about stuff. And you want to sound polite. But And then, I guess, also, there are just... I know there are a lot of different engineering schools. But I think MSOE is a very introverted school. Um, which can be tough at times, especially because, like, the introverted guys, even, I know introverted girls, but we will all, like, reach out to each other because we have the common bond of just being at a school where there's only 25% of us, but, like, the guys just don't really 
reach out or like meet new people and that can be challenging at times because you want to like reach out to people in your classes or like friendly to them and they just don't react. What advantages does your background give you in being that pioneer that you described earlier? I mean, do you have any thoughts like uh, you, you're the, you had to overcome so many different things? I didn't really overcome very much compared to other people. Though. You don't think you did? No. <laughs> I don't know. I beg to differ. I think you've had to overcome quite a bit. I don't deny that I guess I've gone through challenges. I guess it doesn't feel as significant as what some other people have had to go through. I guess some advantages of my background are that my overall perspective towards engineering is a little bit different. I think at times it makes me feel like I'm not a real engineer. I'm hoping to do things that are like more like helpful to people's like lives. And it's like that is what engineering is, but I think a lot of times people like lose focus of that and they're just like, but here's this cool thing we could do to this car or stuff like that. It feels like that's exciting, but I guess I'm more excited about the overall theme of engineering. I've mentioned this, I think, before in this uh, episode, uh, the phenomenon known as third culture kid or TCK. Uh, where you have parents who move away from their home culture and uh, maybe it's to a foreign country, maybe it's to the deep south, who knows. But uh, their child grows up in that culture, not really belonging to that culture and not really belonging to their parents' culture. They kind of have this, they inhabit this third culture. So, you know, what advice do you have to other people who are in your same boat? Try to find ways to tap into that culture, or I guess the culture that you did grow up in, and the one around you. You mentioned uh, to me earlier that you thought it was a, you could find a lot of things in common with other people who had grown up in a similar situation, if not, you know, exactly the same as you, but at least that have gone through that same process, that same experience. Yeah, so I guess... I got involved with the campus ministry. I think I recommend that because you're just being surrounded by people who all share your beliefs and then you can focus on like the more serious things at hand because instead of like asking for advice from a friend and then they give you some completely different advice that you would never follow because it disagrees with what you believe in. We belong to a denomination which is relatively small compared to the population of the United States. It is the one of the dominant religions, actually, in the city of Milwaukee. How has that helped you? What, what, what would you say has been one of the, the pluses of, of moving to a part of the United States where, actually, you find a lot of people who belong to the same religion that you do? Well, I think it's really neat that I can just walk to my church and they all believe the same thing I believe still. Because um, we obviously had a lot of churches in Alabama. There's probably a couple we could walk to, but it didn't mean that they were all wells or that they would be saying things that we agree with. So the convenience is nice, but then also the options as well, because there are a lot of wells churches concentrated in downtown Milwaukee. And then also a lot of just resources as well, like with the campus ministry especially, because they have a couple like gatherings a year and events for us to just hang out as well. And then more like in-depth discussion of biblical topics in relation to life challenges, such as like, for example, there was one about, I think, living a Christian life during the pandemic and trusting God and everything like that. Yeah, I, I imagine that's been difficult for everybody to find a way to stay connected to their faith community during these pandemic times. Well, the denomination we belong to, Wisconsin Synod, it has, it has a culture of its own, right? Even within, but even within that denomination, I would say there are differences between, from congregation to congregation. Uh, the congregation that I was the pastor of in Alabama was a fairly small church. Um, the congregation you belong to now, how many members are there? Several thousand. Say too many. Several thousand. That sounds about right. <laughs> several thousand. So, what was that like uh, moving from the small church to the big church? 
Well, it's weird because everybody's friendly, but like they obviously don't know your name because you're new. But the, I mean, the pastors know my name. There aren't like members of the church. It was like I can name them by name. I can say hi to them because I know who they are, and I'll still say hi to people. But it's like I don't, I don't know their name. I see one person once at a, like an Advent supper. They say hi to me. I get to know them, but then I like don't see them again just because there's so many people. They get swallowed back up into the sea of people. One of the things that's uh, the same, though, one of the things that's consistent is the worship. Mm -hmm. You had some uh, glowing words uh, <laughs> about uh, the liturgy. You want to share that with uh, your your audience? I really enjoy hearing the choir and like all the musical performances and everything that go on during the church service. Especially, like, it's more traditional presentation because it gives the structure that I'm familiar with to the service. And then it's like a nice break from what I experience in the rest of the week. So you enjoy hearing, you know, choirs sing, special music. And obviously there's a lot more options at the church you're at now than the one you were at in Alabama. But there's still some parts that are the same, right? The Confession of Sins. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, the readings, all things which you can participate in. Yeah. And then, you know, in many ways connects you with, you know, not only God, but also the worship experience you had growing up. So ultimately, you know, what would you say is the number one reason that you enjoy going to church? Similar to what I said earlier, with it's a reset from the rest of the week it's different it's like a reminder with everybody else like in that church so like these people all agree with what i'm believing and like not like you're the only person who believes it so when you go out in the week you have your challenges you could be encouraged both by like what the bible says and then that you're not the only person who believes this do you uh care to offer any comments on the worship you've attended here in africa I really enjoy it. Yeah. The choir is beautiful. Mm -hmm. The hymns are cool too, like the way that they're um, lay led. A cappella. Yeah. And yet they're still the basic structure of the liturgical worship, right? Mm -hmm. You were able to follow that, enough of that yesterday, right? Yeah, <coughs> it was like half in Chichewa, half English. But God understands it all. Yes, <laughs> even yeah. if I don't. I don't have any more uh, questions. Uh, do you have any final words that you'd like to offer on your perspective as the uh, third culture kid dealing with crazy parents that moved <laughs> overseas when they were in their midlife crisis? <laughs> There's been a lot of interesting challenges that have come up because of these life changes. But I think there's a lot of like blessings that opened up and showed themselves as well. I'm really glad you guys came, even though it was challenging at times. And we're really, it still is, but yeah. <laughs> we're really glad that you let us go. <laughs> and uh, we do miss you a lot, and we pray for you every day. And we know that uh, finally we're all just kind of wandering through this life. Heaven is our home. So it's good to have you here. Thanks for joining me in the studio today, and uh, thanks for willing to be a participant in this experiment, uh, this podcast. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> and uh, just keep doing God's work. Me too. <laughs> Next time on Home Ties, I've talked about the phenomenon of culture shock, the discomfort you feel when you leave your home country and experience another culture it can be quite unsettling, to say the least. Did you know that you can also experience reverse culture shock when you return home, especially after you've been away for an extended period of time? The reason is not only have you changed as an individual, but your country of origin has also changed. We'll see you next time.